The Susan Draper White Lectures are a funded lecture series that focus on feminist, womanist uh, theologies and, min and ministries. And uh, they reflect the deep commitment that we here at United have uh, to justice for women and to justice for all. So um, without further ado, I would like to uh, ask Trina, um, Dr. Trina Armstrong to come and introduce our speaker and the agenda for today. Good morning, Trina. You guys That's are troopers time. trucking out in this snow. I came like three miles and probably took 30 minutes to get here. So it's good to see you all. Welcome. Um, I have the honor and the privilege to introduce the convener of our panel. Hopefully some of you all made it last night uh, to hear her. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to make it through due to another commitment. I missed it. But uh, I'm sure you all had a good time. I, I happen to know her work. I've had the pleasure of sitting with her and having conversation with her. Um, I would definitely like to spend more time with her, but we both are really busy. But it's, it's exciting to have her here. I'm grateful to be the one to introduce Reverend Dr. Alika P. Galloway. Yeah. <laughs> I like the doctor. We got our doctors in the same year, so we're going to wear it out. <laughs> Y'all just have to indulge us because we earned it. Yes, we did. Uh, she is the co-pastor of Kwanzaa Community Church, PC USA. Um, she holds a Master of Divinity from the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia, in Womanist Theology and World Religions, and she serves as the Executive Director of the Northside Women's Space. It is a safe place for prostituted women and girls to rest, remember, and resist dehumanization. She is nationally known as a womanist scholar and an expert in health disparities impacting African-American females. Uh, she received her D-man from Virginia Union Seminary, and her dissertation addressed the care of African-American women and girls who are victims of prostitution Dr. Galloway is an adjunct professor here at United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities, and she is co-teaching currently a course with Dr. Carolyn Pressler called Engaging the Bible in a Gendered and Racialized World. But her role here is to facilitate this wonderful panel of speakers that she herself will introduce, so I'll turn it over to Reverend Doctor Alika <laughs> Galloway. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Trina. Dr. Trina. <laughs> it is a blessing when you've been through what we've been through. Uh, you need to remind yourself to celebrate a little bit. Uh, God has been good to us. And it is a great privilege and honor to be with all of you today. I, of course, have to greet our esteemed president, um, Dr. Barbara Holmes, who we adore and are grateful for her spiritual leadership as well as her phenomenal academic achievements. Amen. Um, Amen. So while we are here today, why are we here today? And why did we come and embrace the snow and make our way through it? It is because today we're going to be talking about a very um, important subject that I believe is really close to God. I'm a God chaser. And because you're in seminary, in some way you are chasing the divine as well. And what I believe, what I know, and what many of us maintain is that God is always most present on the margins. God is always present in the dislocated places, in the contested spaces, in those spaces where most people see them as individuals, I'm sorry, as invisible. We cannot see the lost, the least, or the locked out. And so being a God chaser, a chaser of the divine, early on, God began to put into my spirit um, one of the things I always have to do is take off earrings. Um, it's part of our tradition to um, put them on, and then we have to take them off when we get ready to do some work. And so 
I started looking at ways in which prostituted women were, individ were, were invisible, and they began to start telling me their stories. They started telling me their stories of pain, yes, but they also started telling me their stories of triumph and courage and um, great mystery and great love for God, even as disembodied selves, where oftentimes the church would not accept them, and yet they carried the meaning of the church with them. One sister early on said, you know, I, I said, Pastor, she said, Pastor Lika, um, um, can you talk to me about God? And so we had a conversation, and I said, well, she said, you know, I love Jesus. And I said, I, I, I'm sure you do. And I said, where, where, what, does, what happens with Jesus when you get ready to do your work? And she said, well, you know, first of all, I have to go into the crack house. So Jesus walks with me to the crack house, mm. and he holds my hand while we're walking to the crack house because most women who practice the kind of survival sex that Northside Women's Space addresses, we, they cannot do that without some kind of chemical. They have to disembody, literally, in order to perform that service. And so she said, I have to go to the crack house first. So Jesus walks with me outside of my door. He sits on my bed as I get ready to get dressed, and I change my identity. Then I go into the crack house. I said, does Jesus go with you? And she said, no, Jesus doesn't go with me because he's a gentleman, you know. Jesus stays on the outside waiting for me, and he waits for me no longer. How does it matter how long I'm in there because I'm getting ready? And then what happens? I, she said, Jesus grabs me by the arm and tells me that I'm beautiful. Does Jesus try to stop you? No, not really, because Jesus knows I've got to do what I've got to do. I've got to do what I've got to do for my children. And so Jesus understands that. And so what, where is Jesus while you are doing what you got to do for, that you got to do for your children? He comes in the room in order to make sure that the John doesn't hurt me. Oh, gosh. And so he stays in the room with me. Now, there is an ancient song that we sing in our tradition, come on in the room. And so what she was doing was she was embodying black church tradition while understanding that most black churches would not have her there. She carried the tradition in her heart. And so she said, Jesus comes in the room. And then what happens, I said. She said, well, what happens is Jesus walks me home. And sometimes we stumble and fall. And when I lay down and cry, Jesus lays down with me. You see why I'm a God chaser? because that's the kind of Jesus I understand, and I need to hear that kind of experience, and that is not for me to de deconstruct her theological paradigm, it is to walk with her. And that's what happens at the Northside Women's Space, is that women are free to bring their experience, to tell their story, because in telling your story, you rest. And when you have been practicing survival sex, oftentimes just to feed your children, just to pay the rent, just to do what you have to do because you got to do it so that you can continue doing what you're assigned to do, feeding and caring for your family, you do whatever it takes. You see, this is not an immoral individual act. This happens because our society immorally treats people so, so as worthless objects rather than divine subjects. They are victims of generational poverty. And so the moral failing is for our society. It is not for the individual that would create systems, a generational impression, um, oppression, multiple layers of loss, where all you have is your body in order to buy bread. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking at in terms of the survival sex trade. And so a group of prostituted women came together after about four years of study along with the University of Minnesota and they created Northside Women's Space. It is led by formerly prostituted women and prostituted women that are still active in the trade. That's one of the identifying factors is that it is not led and designed by the other, it is led and designed by the sisters. This is their space and they come to rest. They come to set a table of critical remembrance. 
because when you carry that kind of pain of multiple losses, you, it is very difficult for you to pull that out of your cells because those losses are embedded then in your cells. And so we sit, at, we sit at a table and we have trauma specialists who you're going to meet today that helps people to critically remember their pain and their loss. And we have a Kim Depp specialist also you'll meet today who is able then to help, help women recover from their chemical dependency because you cannot do this work without depending on some type of alter substance in order to make it happen. And we sit there and we critically remember and some of the things we don't want to, but we can't get healed until we get past that. So we critically remember, we rest, and then we resist dehumanization. We, are, we become embodied self. We become a self where we remember that we are human and not just the object of someone else's sexual fantasy. Mm -hmm. For African American women still hold the title of the erotic self, the erotic other. So we remember that we were created in divine image and God said we were good without proselytizing. And then we, our souls are revived. And we sing songs, we'll break out in songs sometimes. Tell me, how did you feel when you came out of the wilderness? Mm. Leaning on the Lord. So today, I want you to hear two things. One, why women are invested in, in this work, why they come to Northside Women's Space, and why black churches, and I say black churches because that is an ethnic identity, but it is also a cultural paradigm. But more than that, I say it, that we believe that God, that you serve a black God when you serve the least, the lonely, and the locked out. So God becomes black. And so what does the church, what should be an appropriate church response? Or maybe I should say spiritual center or religious entity, however you choose to address that, to women who are prostituted, who are victims of modern day slavery in North Minneapolis, in Minneapolis, not just in Bangladesh, not just in China, not just in India, but right here. What are the causal factors? What are the interdisciplinary answers? And where is the inter interrelationships between generational poverty, horrible theology, by the way, thank God for UTS, um, and the sense of objectification that occurs on a rampant basis all around the world. So today, I want you to meet again in a different way, my sister, the Reverend Dr. Carolyn Pressler, who early on said, I want to come and wash your floors. I was appalled by that. And she said, no, I just need to come to be there, to be in that space. And so she comes to rest, to remember, to revive, and also to resist. So she is a sister who has joined us in the fullness of our experience, not as Dr. Carolyn Pressler, the great um, feminist interpret. I could say all kinds of stuff about you, but she just comes to sit at the table and she becomes sister. And then I want to introduce you to Deacon Arlene Walker, who is in fact our Kim Depp specialist and our trauma specialist and is recovering also from dehumanization and victimization. And then I wanna introduce you to Minister Jerry Anderson, who in fact is a victim survivor of prostitution and she'll tell you her story. And then last but not least, I wanna introduce you to one of your colleagues, Sister Jessica Higgum, who, has, who came early on from graduation um, and said, I just wanna serve. I just want to serve. Is there anything I can do? I just want to be in the space. And so she will tell her story because the truth is not always factual, but it is always in your story. Mm. And so they will tell their story from here on out. Thank you again for coming. Dr. Pressler. There are so many reasons why I engage in Northside Women's Space 
and why I think churches should so engage. But I'll only name three. Well, I'll name four. One is, why wouldn't I want to hang out with these wonderful women? I mean, really, I have that opportunity. Of course I want to be there. But when I started, and these are in chronological order of how they became into my consciousness, not in order of importance. The first was vocation. I was taught in seminary that you look for where the Spirit of God is moving and go there. And it is so clear throughout the scriptures that God is with the least, the lost, and the locked out, and that our job is to do justice, love kindness, and walk attentively with our God. That's the church's God. But I also mean that personally and experientially. I think it was January 2011, it might have been December 2010, when Pastor Lika walked into my office and said she needed me to teach her the Psalms of Lament. And I said, sure, why? And she said, so that I can teach them to women who are victims of sex trafficking so that they can use that art form to learn to cry the pain that stuffed inside them. And I started to cry myself because it was the first time I'd ever seen such a direct, urgent, immediate application of the work I had done for so long. I mean, I do believe Old Testament study is important, but the hermeneutical chain is usually very, very long, the steps from here to where it affects real lives. And then she told me more about the center, and I said, can I come? I need to come. And she said, yes, and it hit me like a ton of bricks that I had to do that. I was afraid, especially after the training that Pastor Alika arranged for us. I was very afraid. But I also knew that to say no to this call was to say no to God, and I couldn't quite do that. Mama used to tease me that I'm a straight B student, that I do baking, beading, and Bible. <laughs> and the first few months that Northside Women's Space was open to the women, I did baking, beading, and Bible, any number of quiches and brownies and breads, remember? Mm, yeah. And then I brought my beads and we beaded, and not every week, but some weeks. And, and I had a real strong sense of what role mine was, and they even asked me to tell them the stories of people like Hagar, the slave woman whom Sarah and Abraham exploited to become pregnant without any choice of her own. And yet it was Hagar who received an angel of the Lord meeting her and saying, as the angel said to Mary, you will bear a son and his name shall be called, in this case Ishmael. And it was Hagar whom God promised, as God promised Abraham, that God would multiply her greatly to make of her a great nation. And it was Hagar, the sexual surrogate, the slave, the one who was raped by Abraham, who is the only person, male or female, in the Hebrew Bible who actually names God. And so I told these stories because as a stu student of the Bible, I have seen that it is not only that God is with the lost, the least, and the locked out, but God often chooses those whom society spurns as God's agent, even to choosing an unwed teenage girl to be the mother of God. And so I told those stories, and I had a sense of what my role was. False sense. And then I hurt my hip, and I knocked out all of the cartilage, and it took me a long time to accept I needed a replacement, and for months and months and months, and almost a year, I couldn't go up those steep cement steps to join my sisters at Women's Space. So I was gone for a year, and when I finally came back, the group, the circle at the table, had grown beyond all recognition and evolved into an incredibly powerful group with Sister Arlene, Leading them, there were 12 to 20 women with meals provided by a whole raft of folk, coordinated by a volunteer named Kathy Nelson, God bless her, followed by workshops on trauma, led by Sister Arlene, and I was so excited to see the program thrive and inspired to listen to these beautiful, strong, 
and gutsy women tell their story. But I was also bewildered, because when I was first there, I knew what my role was, and now I sent week after week puzzling over what am I doing here? What am I supposed to do here? They're getting along very, very well without my baking, my beating, or even my telling stories from the Bible. I, you know, don't tell the other students this, but I can be kind of pokey. <laughs> it took me weeks and probably months to realize that that's the point. In God's incredible economy, I was there, I think I now understand I'm there to listen, but I was also there because it was the one space in my life where I was valued just for being me. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to teach. I didn't have to go to meetings. I didn't have to write reports. I didn't have to write commentary. I was loved just for being and it was the most splendid grace I can imagine. So reason number two for going to Northside Women's Space is because God's there. Not for me to join in the ministry, though I hope I do, but there to love me too. And there for me to learn I don't always have to do to be loved by my sisters and my God. And then, even later, a third reason I need to be part of this community, and I encourage any church invited to do the same, <laughs> the third reason is that God's there. That's the first and second reason, too. But it worked a different way into my consciousness, and that is, like my sister and colleague, Dr. Galloway, I am hungry to be with people who experience and speak about God's words and work in their lives in vivid and concrete ways. I need to be with people whose reliance on Jesus on a daily basis discloses to me God's palpable presence. Because I, like so many, suffer from chronic spiritual amnesia. One of our graduates coming home from a trip to Nicaragua told of an incredibly powerful encounter there. She said, after they had talked a while, a woman there said, you know, you believe in God. We rely on God for our daily survival. I believe in God, but it is so easy to suffer from amnesia and to think that I can achieve and secure my own welfare or that of those I love if I just work hard enough, plan wisely enough, do, do, do. I need my sisters because they rely on God for their survival, and that helps me realize how phony, how false any other form of security can be. At Northside Women's Space, I don't want to romanticize it. We perceive a level of generational poverty, trauma, violence, ugly stuff that I have not experienced and can barely imagine, and we talk about it, and we talk about accountability, discipline, changing our own attitudes, and working for our own healing. We talk about our families, about children, jobs, and hopes for jobs. And whatever conversation we start, I've understood from Malika, this is of all womenists, Christians, but whatever w conversation we start with, our talk will turn to God and to faith and to Jesus and to divine grace in a palpable, concrete, and vividly real way. I think I have time for one little story. A sister, I'm going to call her Rose, came in one day looking utterly dazed. And she told us when it was her turn to check in her story. She and her kids were homeless. She had only two or three dollars left. 
And that morning she was, had given up. She was going back out on the streets to turn some tricks, to earn some money to feed her children. But first she took him to McDonald's and spent her last dollars on hamburgers for him. And while she was there, I'm saying this happened. I'm not making it up. A man came over, informed her that he was a prophet and that God had told him to pray for her. And he sat down. And he started to pray. And while he was praying, three different people whom she did not know, and he didn't either, interrupted them and said, oh, God has told me I should come here and give you this money. And he handed the bills to her. And instead of going back out on the streets, she came to us with renewed hope and renewed determination. I believe in God. Rosie depends upon God for her daily survival. And I need her so that I can get over my middle class separation that believes I can do it by my own work. So I go to, God, to Northside Women's Space for three reasons, and I encourage the churches to do the same. God is there. God is there. God is there. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. I told him I didn't think I need this, I, you know. I, <laughs> but um, the reason I'm at Northside Women's Space is because it is a safe place, a place of love, nurturing, and support um, for turning lives around, um, turning our lives around. And I say our because I am a survivor of sexual abuse substance abuse, domestic violence, you name it. Oh. It was the love, the love of the people of Kwanzaa Community Church that loved me until I began to love myself. Mm. While no woman wakes up as a child, a young girl, and say, I want to be a prostitute. I want to sell sex for a living. There's issues. Could it be domestic abuse? Could it be child abuse? Could it be neglect? I always, and I think everyone should always, whenever you encounter someone, presume that they may have issues with trauma, because yeah. Yeah. none of us are exempt. No. Mm -hmm. So safety is one of the uh, first things I noticed about uh, the Northside Women's Space, is this place was safe for me. Yeah. I don't have to worry about being beat, abused. I don't have to worry about being talked about mm -hmm. because of my past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm loved and supported and encouraged, feeling empowered. Mm -hmm. Each time we gather around that table, yeah. these lovely women I have gotten acquainted with. Mm -hmm. As Christians, we, we have this issue, a moral issue, I believe, around what it should look like. Mm -hmm. But Jesus gave the example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He dwelt among the, the lost, the least, the shut out. Yeah. That's the women at the Northside Women's Space. He gave an example for us to follow. Mm -hmm. Not to judge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because no one knows why a woman chooses mm -hmm. to be in that position. A lot of women that I've ran into in terms of my work at the Northside Women's Space 
is, is child, it comes from childhood. Mm -hmm. Mothers have exploited their daughters. Yeah. I always think of our lives as a tapestry. You ever seen tapestry? Mm -hmm. Beautiful, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Flip it over. Yeah. Mm. Right. Flip it over. Right. <laughs> you got all this disconnect. I call it discombobulation, mm -hmm. if that's a word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. But I know, in my experience with God and the God that is at Kwanzaa and the Northside Women's Space, I know that those pieces can be put together. Yeah. I know that they can be mended together. Mm -hmm. Just like Dr. Alika said, Jesus gives us an example. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm a Christian, a true Christian, read it. Mm -hmm. The message of love. Mm -hmm. What it says, love conquers all. Yeah. Love is the most important of all. Yeah. Hope, faith, but love is the most important. And that's exactly what I feel at the Northside Women's Space. Nothing but a lot of love, and I could just be me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could just be that, that little girl that was abused. I could just be that woman who was beat. I could just be that woman who was sold on the streets. I could just be me. That's so wonderful. That's so wonderful. Thank you, God. I rest there. I remember there. It's hard conversation that go on around that table. I, I met a woman one day who wouldn't even have a conversation. She was angry with me because I brought up the issue of trauma around what was going on in her life. If we don't begin to work at this trauma, while I know trauma would never be healed, but it don't have that power pack. Mm. Once I know, once I can call it, right. once it start moving yeah. mm -hmm. through my body and through my brain, mm -hmm. it don't have that power pack. I can live free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That lady was mad at me. Mm -hmm. Oh, she wanted to whoop me. <laughs> you know? I got a little scared too. <laughs> I wanted to shut down. <laughs> But I say, no, this is, this is my calling, and I'm going I'm to help free the captives. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm going to help free the captives. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, one of the things I do know is that our issues have, um, our issues have kept us disconnected from, from Jesus. Yeah. And I ask the question. When did you disconnect from me? Mm. And I heard the answer. I didn't disconnect from you. You disconnected from me. I promised you I will never leave you nor forsake yeah, you. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe that today. I remember the day that God created me wonderfully, mm -hmm. beautifully. Yeah. As he did all of us sitting around this room. So let's live his example. I got one thing I wanted to share before, uh, I found on the internet before I stop. The New Testament clearly teaches that the church is to be a community of support, nurture, service, and also discipline. Admonishing one another is an important component of Christian love as depicted in the Bible. Contrary to the view of our postmodern culture, we must agree with our culture that admonishment based on nothing more than personal opinion will be presumptuous and arrogant. Mm -hmm. However, with the word of God, we have a basis for correcting each other. And such correcting, when, when practiced in the spirit of grace and acceptance, will have life-transforming power. <laughs> Thus Paul says, and concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, yeah. filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. Mm -hmm. Scripture mentions various types of discipline, but each type is appropriate, appropriate 
in different, in different circumstances. But consider carefully what God will want in any situation. And that's what I have to share with you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'll be that woman that got, you know, really mad at her. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I'm a, a generational um, prostitute. My mom was a prostitute, and um, I was also raised in foster homes. And so this one foster home um, was grooming me, grooming, grooming me for the chair, uh, for the street. Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> That's okay. all right. Take your time. Next and um, in any case. Um, Within my trials and tribulations, I became an inner city minister because I didn't like the way the church was not caring for the people who are lost, abused. And so um, I became an inner city minister so that I could be, go around and take care of the people that the church wouldn't take care of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I was led to Kwanzaa. And um, it was a wonderful thing. The first sermon that I heard was by Pastor Lika's husband, which he said that you can question God. I was raised not to question God, you know? So therefore, I kept all that sorrow in. You know, who am I supposed to talk to? So anyway, after my husband had passed, I started having anxiety attacks and all that kind of good stuff. And so I went to the, um, the psychiatrist and she started putting labels on everything that happened to me. Now, in the meantime, I'm going around trying to save women, you know, and I'm telling my story. But, you know, you can know a story and keep telling it and telling it. And sometimes you don't know what it is until you finally hit that one wall. Yeah. And it makes you stop to listen to yourself and to listen to the others that have been trying to tell you something. Yeah. And then you can put it together. Yeah. And so when... Um, then the labels started coming out and everything that happened to me, I was devastated, mm. totally. So then um, I had been coming to the, the women's space, but I never really introduced my, well, I never introduced myself as a, as a, a survivor. I always introduced myself as a minister because I wanted to see where the women was coming from. Mm. So when we went, when we were doing the class trauma, <laughs> I remember, I said, trauma? Nobody told me we were gonna do trauma. <laughs> what do you mean trauma? Oh, I was highly upset. Mm -hmm. And I tried to go through all the steps about, you know, looking away and uh, calming myself down and stuff, but I just broke out in tears. So anyway, she started labeling and stuff and started breaking it down. And then I realized <laughs> what trauma was, is, and I was going through it. And so I really thank her for that, even though I was really upset with her. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is, is that you're never too old to come out of trauma. Yeah. Yeah. You're never too old to look over your life from the past and see where you are right now. Mm -hmm. And you're never too, too old to, or too young to um, be introduced to the Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because when you look at it, when I was a little girl, I used to sleep with my hand up to God. I didn't know Jesus, but I knew God because of all the things that was happening to me. And so um, with the women's space, I would listen to their stories. And then um, somebody said one day, well, you know, I don't know why these pastors think they know about anything and this and that and that and the other. So I sat quietly till it was time for me to check in. And I told them, I'm a survivor. I'm an ex IV drug user, ex prostitute woman, and I married my pimp. So I know what God can do because he brought me from the ground up. He sent me to places that no other church people would go. Mm -hmm. in, under the viaducts and um, in nursing homes and just different places 
where that you didn't really want to hear their story, but you just wanted to take care of the outside of them. Yeah. Here I found a church that wanted to dig deep inside. Mm -hmm. So when Pastor Lika started talking about the prostitution, she hasn't really heard my story yet, but I was just in the, in the wings, just listening, how she should do things and you know, how she was gonna do it and all that. And I would just be around and sit and listen, <laughs> you know? So then one day I remember we were sitting at the table, it was her and I, and she asked me a question. And all of a sudden I just told her the story. And she was like, I did not know. Mm -hmm. I did not know. So you probably hear the story on the second part because I'm not quite sure how we're doing it. <laughs> Do I, just tell the story. The oh, okay, so I have. So what happened was, um, like I said, uh, you know, I was living in uh, Key West, Florida at this particular time, and I was on, um, we didn't, it wasn't crack then, it was just like mainlining. So uh, mainlining is shooting drugs into your veins. So I would do coke. And so when I get finished, then I would go out. And um, there's rules on the street that you're supposed to follow yeah. for your own safety. It's that organized that there's rules and who you should be with and who you shouldn't mm -hmm. be with and who you, um, you make sure that they know that you have a person with you, otherwise they will either um, buy you or just kidnap you because you have no one to watch over you. And so I went, um, I went to this club and I was high off of cocaine and I was drinking and this one guy came up to me and said he wanted my services, and I was like, okay. He says, I, my white band out there, one of the rules is never to get into a band or a truck. But I was high, and I said, well, no, I don't want to go in there. He says, it's just me, honest, it's just me, it's just me. So I said, okay. Well, when I got in the band, there was four other guys, and they did what they wanted to me until six o'clock in the morning, where they just, cast me out on the ground. My dress was all ripped. I had one shoe on, so I just took that and threw that in the ocean. And I was walking, I was walking trying to get to my house on Duval Street. And so um, as I was walking, because the sun was rising, people were looking at me, giving me dirty looks, pointing, laughing, mm -hmm. saying, um, you got anything left, you know? and all that, and I just, I just couldn't believe it. You know, nobody stopped to help me, to take me to the police station, to the hospital, or nothing. They just laughed and, you know, shrugged, you know, turned their heads. So as I was walking, there was this church on the right-hand side, mm -hmm. and it had big steps coming down. So I needed to rest. So I climbed those stairs, and I sat on the stairs to rest. And a parishioner came out of the church and looked at me and said, get off our steps. We don't serve your kind here. I put my head down, rolled myself up, and I walked home. Mm -hmm. So when um, I came to Minnesota, um, I decided that I wanted to help, mm -hmm. you know, because if the church doesn't help you, who is? Come on, come on. You're supposed to be safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be loved. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be cared for, yeah. see what they could do for you, yeah. you know? Put you in the right direction, help you out. <laughs> you know, even if you're scared to bring them to your house, do it anyway, because you never know. You know, we're not all bad people. No. Sometimes we're bad because the pimps were bad to us, yeah. or the people that treated us was bad to us, and so that's just a, a way of getting, you know, giving, you know, um, de yeah, my de defense is up, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, in the meantime, you also can't talk to anybody about it, mm -hmm. how you feel, and so that's where the trauma starts lying down and gets deeper and deeper, mm -hmm. you know, and you keep doing everything. I went to school and all that kind of stuff, but never really told my story, mm -hmm. because I would, get shunned out yeah. or thrown out because I had done that already, I had been through that already, why should I tell my story? But when I told the pastor, Alika, and she was like, I am so sorry. Yeah. 
And the way she says it, you know, if you're not a crier, you will cry. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, when we started the group, I didn't say anything for a while. But when the girls started, you know, talking about the church and how pastors don't do this and do that and they don't know what we're talking about, I had to tell them they were wrong. I had to tell them who I am, mm -hmm. where God has brought me, mm -hmm. and why I'm sitting at this table yeah, listening so to your stories to let you know that God is real. Mm -hmm. He is yeah. here, and he will send you places that you need to go to so that you can heal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could tell them the story and how mighty he is, how he can bring you up from the trenches. Yeah. Set you on solid ground. Yeah. Push you a little bit because you're going to be scared but he'll protect you. Mm -hmm. He will protect you. Mm -hmm. Now, it might not be the kind of protection that you may think, like the girl that she went, um, she said she walked with Jesus, went into the crack house and all that kind of stuff. It may not be where you think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because the women on the street, they pray, Lord, please let me yeah. make it home alive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. You know, Lord, please make sure that I don't OD out here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, those are true prayers. They're from the heart. They're from yeah. the guard, oh, no. yeah. from the gut. You oh, know, yeah. it's not prearranged and mm -hmm. um, I didn't know any scriptures because I can't remember scriptures. So there was no throwing scriptures in there that people didn't understand anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, but this is from my heart. Come on now. This is from the tears. Mm -hmm. And this is from the madness that I went through that I held in my mind, my heart, and my soul that I couldn't tell anybody mm -hmm. about. Yeah or anybody could bring it out of me because they didn't know how, because they haven't right. been there or done that. Come on now. So I sit here as a child of God, mm. letting everyone know there is a savior. Amen. Mm -hmm. There is a savior. Mm -hmm. And not only did he die to save us, mm -hmm. but also to show us mm -hmm. that we can help save others. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> and so then, Man, I gotta... just can't hardly talk. Mm -hmm. Jessica, this is one of y'all's. This is this is a student at UTS. Yay! Yeah. 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 So you get to wrap it up. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can follow any of that. Um, <laughs> so okay, why am I here? Why am I with NWS? Um, I guess the short version is um, starting in high school, I was very passionate about people with drug addictions. And that was kind of the path that I thought I was going to go down, was um, working with people who face those kind of issues. And then in college, I, um, for my work, I worked at a campus ministry. And I was given the task to research the issue of sex trafficking and see what we could do with it. And so I started researching, learning about it, just studying and studying and filling my mind with it and just was heartbroken with what I learned. And so eventually started a sex trafficking awareness week at that school. And um, now they have it every single year. They show documentaries, they have speakers come in, all kinds of stuff. Um, so that was just the beginning. Um, and another reason is I came, I came there to learn, just to learn about these women, to hear their voices, to hear their experiences. Um, it's amazing how, how much they've gone through and how, yet how loving they are towards others. Um, when I walked in for the first time, I was the only white girl, and I had never been in a room full of black people, black women, and I'm just mm -hmm. like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I think it was Arlene just kind of uh, welcomed me in, was like, come on over, grab some food, sit down, just sit around the table. And I'm like, okay, all right, <laughs> awesome. And it was just such a weird experience for me because um, entering into that was so different compared to entering into a room full of white people that I didn't know. Um, there was just this warmth, this welcome, this family feel, which I had never felt with white people before. It's just... I don't know. Um, and so I've learned a lot through that. I've learned just 
the difference in, I guess, cultures, um, the differences in um, just people and how I can be different and how to acknowledge uh, the differences and how to counter those things in the world. Um, and another reason I'm here is, to, is because I feel alive around the table. I experience God. I um, really... Um, Sister Carolyn always talks about how she feels and sees Jesus in each of these women. And it's true. Like, you can't sit around the table and not see Jesus. You can't not see God moving. You can't not hear God speaking. Um, there have been so many times where I come to the table with my little struggles, and I'm like, they're going to think this is stupid, but they still they embrace me. They love me. They give me advice. They have so much wisdom, and uh, they just love me through my... Um, my problems. Um, so why should the church care? Um, my question is, why wouldn't you want to be like Jesus, hanging out with women like this? Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> um, and some of the bigger questions I started thinking about, or bigger issues, is that um, the issue of sex trafficking and prostitution, it affects the whole entire economy. It affects... Um, it affects every one of you in this room, whether you realize it or not. Um, there's, it's intertwined with pornography, just every, it's everywhere. Just the sexualization that you see on TV, everything. Um, and so the church can be powerful if you choose to let it be and if you choose to make it be powerful. And I think it is important that the church embraces their power and steps out and decides to have a voice in the world instead of standing back and being quiet. Um, so my challenge is for you to take action in your churches, in your whatever group communities that you're involved in, to take action. Yes, pray. prayer is awesome and good action, but take bigger steps of action. Um, giving money, of course, is always a good one. And, uh, getting involved, volunteering, doing, speaking out towards or for issues in legislation that involve these women. Um, just bring groups of people, people together to create awareness and to actually get movement started towards anything involving this issue. I don't know. You could just <laughs> um, So that's my challenge. It's for you to take action. Um, and one of the verses that I thought of um, when thinking about this talk was James uh, one twenty two, which says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, oh, yeah. deceiving yourselves. Um, and I guess it goes through verse 25. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his nat natural face in a mirror. For he, looks at his natural f um, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Mm. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Thank you.